Ladies and gentlemen, tonight I have the wonderful opportunity to sit down with uh, one of the real monuments in jazz, and especially as a bassist, uh, Dave Holland. Now, uh, Dave, um, you were fortunate enough to come into the scene in New York at a very uh, important and uh, influential time for jazz as far as the fusion era and the start of that. Mm. And, uh, you know, you got started in London, you were playing gigs in London, right? You started at playing ukulele, right? Well, not doing gigs on ukulele. I started on ukulele when I was four. Okay. And then oh. uh, when I was about 10, I got a guitar, and then mm. I had a little band with some guys uh, when I was 13. Yeah. You know, yeah. playing rock and roll. We were listening to all the music coming out of wow. America. Wow. And I left school when I was 15, and he was continuing to do that, playing mm. clubs and dances. Uh, and then, you know, started really listening to jazz around that time, too, and got big influence from Ray yeah. Brown and Leroy Vinegar. So I moved to London when I was 17. I lived there for four years, and I was... Uh, and that you know, must have been a, an awesome time, because that was the, the tail end of the British rock. Uh, yeah, you know, it was. I, I was actually, by then, really into uh, jazz really deeply. Okay, and, you yeah. know, I was playing a lot of different kinds of musical situations. Mm -hmm. uh, but as time went by, by the time I was 19 or 20, I mean, jazz became really my main focus as a music that I wanted to play. Wow. And I'd planned to move to New York and, uh, and I'd met a lot of musicians from New York who'd yeah. come through London. They well, encouraged me yeah, to go there. That's yeah. great, man. And, and you know, um, when you were in London, you told me one story about a jam with Jimi Hendrix. Could you just briefly touch on that? That wasn't in London, that? that was in New York. Oh, it was in New oh, York? Yeah, 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 really? Yeah. Uh, you tell us just a little bit about yeah, it that? Yeah, it was when I was with Miles. It must have been 69 or something okay, like that. Okay. And uh, John McLaughlin was living in New York by then too. He'd moved yeah. from London to New York. Okay. And uh, I got a call one day and Jimmy wanted to get together and do some wow. jamming just in a recording studio. And, yeah. and that's what we did. And, you know, there was some tape running and it, it's appeared on a few bootleg things. Really? Yeah, yeah. I'll have to uh, I'll have to figure that one out, man. I'd, I'd love to hear that, and I'm sure... Yeah, he, he was jamming, you know, he's just playing guitar, he wasn't singing. It was, it was Buddy okay. Miles was on drums. So, wow. Yeah. Well, did you feel like he was moving in that direction of jazz? You know, he was sort of always... I felt like a developing musician, just mm. like, uh, you know, a lot of musicians that are really deeply involved in, in learning and growing, yeah, you yeah. know. And he was looking to put a new band together when he put the band of gypsies together. Mm. He was living, <coughs> living uh, or had a lot, of, lo a lot of activity upstate New York, actually where I'm living now in the Mid-Hudson Valley. A gentleman uh, named Randy Kay told me about being in his band. Yeah, yeah. I know Miles and he had, you know, talked about doing something together and unfortunately got cut short, of course, when yeah, I mean, passed, uh, you know. You came into the band with Miles uh, at the tail end of Ron Carter um, I know I studied with Ron and Ron has told me, you know, he, he felt like he wanted to continue the acoustic sound. He wasn't uh, ready to be dedicated to that electric uh, thing. And you, but you guys were on one particular record where it was half Ron and half... Yeah, that uh, was the crossover. Well, yeah. as, as I understand it, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I joined the band in the summer of 68. Mm -hmm. and for at least a year or more, Ron hadn't been working with the band. Miles had been picking up bass players in okay, different cities. Yeah. And Miles wasn't using an electric bass at that time. It was still an acoustic bass really? chair. Mm. And he heard me, he didn't know I was an electric bass player. He, 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 I had started on electric bass, mm -hmm. but by the time he heard me in London, I was playing all acoustic. And so I joined the band and, and came into the band when it was still playing all the traditional repertoire. Yeah. You know, around midnight, Stella by Starlight, and then wow. the newer things like Nefertiti and uh, you know uh, Wayne's compositions. Yeah. And things. So it, it was really I'd been with the band at least nine months or twelve months. By the time we did Bitches Brew, a lot of the material was starting to need something different, and that's mm -hmm. when I I actually you know said to Miles, which you know how about if I stop playing bass guitar, and that's when I started including bass guitar in it. But for a, lot, for a while, you know, I was playing both. And mm. it was only the last few months I was in the band 
that I was playing on the electric. And then actually I had the same feeling that Ron expressed, which is by that point, I was like, wait a minute, I'm getting too far away from the acoustic. Yeah, yeah. And I, I wanted to, you know, concentrate on that. And that's why mm. I left the band at that point. Well, I mean, uh, it's just a, such an interesting time in history, and especially for jazz. Bitches Brew uh, is just a, a monumental record in jazz history. I mean, it just, it, uh, it fundamentally changed the way um, the music was viewed, and, and, and it brought a young audience that had not previously been interested in jazz into the music. Oh, yeah. Um, could you tell us a little bit about making of that? Because I've heard various stories about you guys just played and played and played and played, and, uh, you know, T.O. just kind of came around and cut, 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 cut. Is that true, or was there really more of a direction? And um, do you have any recollections of that day? Well, yeah, of course. Uh, you know, for one thing, the uh, the record wasn't made in one session. You know, mm. we what was happening at that point was that when we weren't on tour, Miles would usually take the band in the studio, and we didn't record the working band. He always augmented it with some other musicians. Mm -hmm. So uh, we'd been doing, you know, we did Silent Way the record Silent Way before yeah, that, yeah, yeah. which had included John McLaughlin, and it was already moving in that direction, in a it. sort of jam direction in a sense, where, where there'd be a, a, a groove set up, maybe a bass line would be developed, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and a melody that would be put on top of that. And I think Bitches Brew was an extension of that idea. And uh, we all came together in the studio, it's quite a large group, you know, three, yeah. three keyboard players, and. Uh, you know, Miles had some uh, ideas that he'd written out, just some chord voicings and uh, a couple of bass lines for tunes and things like that, that we sort of developed. And, and he w walked around the group talking to each of us individually mm. about the, the part. Or, he, you know, he would talk to the drummer and say, you know, I want to hear a little something, try something like this. And yeah. So it, it was sort of put together in a very organic way, but wow. it was put together out of a concept that Miles had, for sure. sure. But he wanted it to be loose, I think. He wanted it to be, have this feeling of exploring and sort of searching. Yeah. And that, that, I think that's what makes wow. the thing special, because it's not like something that's down pat and just you know, slick and, you know, yeah. finished. It's, a, it's something that's in the process of creation. Yeah. And you feel that when you listen to it. Oh, it's that's fantastic, awesome. man. And I'm sure that's your creation. Da dong, da dong. That was da -dung. Miles' bass line. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah, he wrote that. And he wrote some voice things that went on top of that okay. for the people yeah, players. Yeah. They w and you know we were all like, well, what are we supposed to do with this stuff? You know. And <laughs> yeah. So there was like this sense of like, okay, let's see what we can make of it. You yeah. Know? Um, and then as we recorded, Miles would just, he'd play some and then he'd point at, at Wayne, you know, and Wayne would play some yeah, or then yeah. he'd say, okay, you know, then they'd stop and then the keyboards would maybe play a little bit. And so we did a few takes like that and I think, as you said, at the end of it all, uh, when all the recording was done, there was a lot of editing and splicing mm -hmm. that was done to put things together, you know. Any, yeah, anything yeah. in particular that Miles said to you or share with you that uh, you'd like to share with us that, that uh, still resonates with you today? Yeah, I, you know, I've told this story before, but, uh, but it is one of my key moments, I think, with Miles, which is after I'd been with the band for quite a while, I was starting to play uh, more of a counterpoint role on the bass with mm. the music rather than, you know, the functional yeah, supportive yeah. role. And Miles let this go on for a little while, and then he came to me one night and he said, "Hey, Dave, you know you are a bass player." <laughs> and I, yeah. it kind of, you know, really focused me again on thinking about, okay, how can I find a balance between the role of the bass and still ha providing what a bass needs to provide in a band, but at the same time, sort of expand on that and mm -hmm. find a way to, to to be playing a role that was more of a dialogue role as well in the music and, and interactive, you know. So I was, I was searching for that balance in my playing and I, Miles helped me kind of ground it and sort that's of great. You know, figure that out. And that has something that has been something that stayed with me, you know. Yeah. Well, Dave, uh, you got to get back to your family. You're here on, you. on vacation and uh, I really appreciate your time with us. 
um, and uh, hopefully we'll sit down again in the future for another conversation. Okay. I'd like to do that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, it was man. a pleasure. Take care. Check him out, Katz. He's one of the top uh, musicians in the history of jazz. So really uh, tune in, check out Dave Holland, and uh, thank you once again. You're man. welcome. Thanks.